All right, let's go out to West Palm Beach, Florida, and talk to Buck. What's up, Buck? Good morning. Good morning. What's up? Dr. John, how you doing? We're, we're getting it done, man. How about you? Party in, in my living room right now, which <laughs> is not true, but okay. Uh, how can I help, man? Big fan. I want you to know this is like talking to family, by the way. Uh, we're huge, huge fans of, of you guys, of your whole team. Well, anyway. I, I appreciate you letting me be a part of your fam, dude. That's awesome. Absolutely. Um, I wrote in about how to be more respectful or be a better husband, be nicer to my wife. Um, and that's, I guess that's a big, <laughs> big thing. And we'll drill down into it. Yeah. It uh, usually takes a lot for a man to pick up the phone and make that call. So what's been going on? Uh, you know, like most recently, it's just been kind of like nitpicky stuff like cooking or, um, uh, you know, I've, I've found where there's been a few occasions where I've corrected her in front of people on, you know, probably trivial stuff or details about stories or stuff like that. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, you know what? There's a little Jiminy Cricket that should be in there that should filter the stuff before I say it out loud. And I think maybe he's broken or on vacation. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So here's my hot take. This type of criticism and really most all criticism is almost always about you, not her. It's this idea that you're chasing a feeling of what you will feel like when everything in your world is perfect or specific to her. You're chasing a feeling of what you're going to feel like when she does everything right. When she cooks the meal exactly right and you sit down and eat it and she gets the details of the story just right. And her body looks just right. These little nitpicky, the, the little nitpicky things or the big things, right? Criticism is almost never about the other person. It's about you. And it almost right. always stems from the fact that you don't like your life. Dang. Okay. Tell me, tell me I'm I wrong. Can see that. No, no, no. I, I can see that. I can definitely see that. Why don't you like your life? Uh, gosh, I think it's been, and, and I'll just say this. We, you know, she and I have both been in recovery okay. from alcohol for the last year ish, nine months actually, uh, for me. Uh, and so, so, so it's not fun anymore. <laughs> you're, I mean, you're, you, the, the smoke is cleared. You're in the grind out phase, right? We are, we are, we are absolutely. Okay. And, um, and that, you know, again, that was like a thing we've been together for five years and, you know, and that was a part of our entire, you know, existence together up to this point. And so it's like, now we're figuring out like how we, how we work moving forward. And so there's, you know, that's a lot, there's a lot of stuff to deal with. Right? There's a lot of things maybe that I'm for sure that I haven't dealt with in my life throughout my life. The same goes for her. So then I think. But hold on. She's, happens, she's not on the phone. So let's just deal right, with you. Right, right. And you. you're probably pretty good at feeling like I need to work on a thing. And then you bring everybody in on that because it's all of our fault. Fair. Fair. Yeah. I want to just deal with you. Okay. What is it about you? that you don't think you're enough when you're sitting down at the table. Cause let me, let, let me give like a, let me give a, like a 30,000 foot view. And what I'm going to say is embarrassing. Okay. It's just a shameful thing in my life. I am an embarrassment to Texas males everywhere. The entire stereotype when it comes to grilling, I terrible at it. I forget, I burn it. I put like this beautiful raw piece of meat in front of my family. I'm, I'm embarrassing at it. And so cooking is about eating and I'm terrible at it. When my wife's gone, my son and I eat something that he has named Hank and dad mush. That's everything in the, in the, in the fridge that's left. My wife didn't criticize me and just sit there and poke and poke and poke because for her cooking is about eating. She went and became 
the best griller I know. I have a hard time buying a steak at a restaurant anymore because she's so good at cooking it. And so instead of telling me how much I sucked and what a loser I was, she wasn't chasing a feeling because she likes her life. What she wanted was to eat well. And so as a partner, she took that part of our relationship on. And so that's something as simple as cooking or as simple as getting a story right. You, though, don't like you. And I'm wondering if nine months into being sober, you're just tired of standing on the street corner without any clothes on. Gosh. That could, I mean, that could absolutely be true. And, and, and again, there's, you know, still like, cause we're in a step program. I'm not, I haven't really, really, you know, gotten into the weeds into me. It's been, you know, it's been on the surface and it's been, okay, you know, we're flying this plane sober for, you know, mm -hmm. doing it. But you're nine months in. Uh, do me a favor. Talk directly into the phone for me. Um, you, oh, you, sorry about you, that. You, you've been doing this for nine months now. And I'm not talking yeah. about going spelunking back to your childhood and all that. I'm asking about the little things. Do you treat your body with dignity and respect? Do you work out? Do you exercise? Do you go for walks? Do you, like, only eat garbage on purpose, not just as a way of life? Yesterday was Halloween, and I, <laughs> I kind of went for it. <laughs> I kind of went for it, but I, I planned for it, right? Do you have any sort of spiritual practice? Do you have a group of buddies outside of AA that you just sit around and hang out with and you know you have value to them just because you show up, not because you have some special skill? I do. I have a group of uh, men that, I, you know, like core group of men that are close friends that we, you know, we speak often and we speak about these things too. Actually, I had a call this morning uh, with, with one of them after, after Halloween. Often this idea that I don't like my life or I don't like the role I'm playing in my own story. I don't like how I feel exposed like this. Um, can often be distilled down to, I don't trust me yet. Or I don't tell myself the truth. And that can be, all the way out to addiction, that can be to pornography, but that can also be things like, I'm going to go work out tomorrow, and then you don't. I'm going to start eating right tomorrow, and then you don't. I'm going to be really nice to my wife. I'm going to keep my mouth shut tonight because I'm always poking at her, and then you don't. And so you get the criticism of your wife, but beneath that, you know that you can't even trust you. And that usually is what sends people on their tailspin. Either that or they're trying to protect themselves from something. I had a... Right. um. It hasn't come out yet, um, but I, I recently had the comedian John Christ on the show, interviewed him, and um, it was a pretty extraordinary conversation. He was way more open and vulnerable than I expected. And um, he mentioned something that I've only heard people in inpatient recovery say, and it's very true. And he was talking about somebody that he was in recovery with um, who had been just tragically sexually abused. And he said that she was very clear. Alcohol saved her life. And here she was in rehab trying to come up with plan C because plan A was torture. Plan B was I can save my life with this thing and now this thing is killing me. So I'll ask you, what was alcohol protecting you from? I think you were drinking because it worked. What, what was it working to yeah. help you with? I think it was keeping, you know, the, I get, again, like the real conversations between she and I, those at bay. Right. And, and I, I mean, if I'm honest, I'd, I almost feel like I'm protecting myself from my wife. I don't know if that sounds strange or not. Not at all because she can hurt you real bad if you go all in. Right. Yeah. You've been burned before. Well, I, I've been, I was divorced, but it was my, it was my choice, you know? Yeah, um, but, 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 I, but you had a picture of what your life was going to look like and that picture collapsed. Right. Right. Yeah. Here, and her, you know, her go-to has been to bail, you know, when things mm -hmm. get tough or when things get seedy or, you know, our conversation, she's like, well, you know, we should probably separate. Or, mm -hmm. I'm like, 
well, I disagree. You know, I'm like, that's not the, that wasn't the plan, you know? And so my guess is y'all have some sort of dance where you are terrified of somebody leaving you. So you leave first or you duct tape over those feelings and you squash them down with alcohol, with Xanax, with whatever you need to do. And she is tortured yet needs to learn to head into the storm, which for her is I've got to lean towards this discomfort, this discomfort, this uncomfortable conversation. I can't bail every time because she leans back and your alarms sound and that makes you poke and that makes her alarm sound, which makes her retreat more. And then you get louder and then the whole dance goes and goes and goes until one of you has the courage to say, I'm not dancing anymore. Right. And that's what I end up on the phone with you. (laughs) Right. So here, here's, here's plan number one. Just like you did in the first couple of months in AA, I want you to take your wife somewhere out to eat, get out of the environment in your home, and I want you to look her dead in the eye, probably write this down so you can read it. And I want you to tell her, I have been treating you like I'm better than you. And I criticize and I poke and I blame Because I'm scared. And I'm sorry. And that ends right now. And then I want you to look her in the eye and say, I may stop myself halfway through a sentence at a party. I might get up and walk away for 30 seconds or for 30 minutes. I will come back. But I refuse to be disrespectful to you. I'm not going to criticize you anymore because criticism is about me, not you. We both know you're not a great cook. Awesome. But I want to eat. So I'm going to learn how to cook or we're just going to have a season of takeout till we figure this out. (laughs) Right? Right. Now, accountability is different than criticism. Accountability is a partnership. Accountability is when I call my friend Lane Norton and I say, hey, I'm going to try to lose this much weight. I'm going to text you every week. And he goes, I got you. Or my friend Jordan Syed. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you pictures of the scale once every few weeks. And if you don't get one, holler at me. That's accountability. That's not criticism. Right. That's somebody agreeing to walk alongside me as I get better. In your wife's case, hey, I'm going to really make an effort to learn how to cook. I want you to be honest with me every meal. And you go, are you, are you super sure? <laughs> right? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll walk alongside you. That's different than just bombing and criticizing and criticizing and bombing. And that's step one, coming to her and saying this ends. Step two is making a plan to get up, stop the cycle when you start criticizing, when you start poking, when you start throwing little grenades, not big ones, little annoying ones. And the third one is, what do you need to do on a daily basis to regain trust with Buck And to start feeling alive in your own home again. Spoiler alert, you can only feel alive. Gosh, I hate saying this because I wish there was another way. You can only feel alive through vulnerability, period. You have to be willing to say, ah, here's what I need. Ah, here's what I want from you. Can you help me meet this need? It might be sexual, it might be friendship-wise, it might be go for a walk, it might be I want to lose some weight, it might be any number, I want to get another job, any number of things. But you got to be willing to to put it out there. And she might say, oh, thank God, yes, I'm in. Or she might go, I ain't doing that. And i got to live with that tension and that reality. But you're avoiding it. Avoidance, 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 avoidance. You've done some really amazing work being nine months sober. I'm super proud of you, man. That is really hard, especially doing it with somebody else that you live with. Y'all are radically changing the dynamic of your home, and that's hard. It's impressive. Both of you need to take the next step, which is, what do you need from me so that you can be whole and help me with what I need? And so then I can help you. And we're going to walk alongside each other, building a new marriage that way. You got this, my friend. I'm going to send you two copies of Building a Non-Anxious Life. I want you and your wife to read that book together. I'll give you a roadmap, not for addiction. You keep going to your meetings. 
absolutely don't stop going to your meetings. But it's going to give you all a roadmap to begin to build a house where you all trust yourselves, you trust each other, and you build whew, a home of peace. And for your body, dude, peace feels scary right now. But you keep practicing and you keep practicing. I'm proud of you, man. Start respecting your wife. Stop criticizing. You live a life worth living.